separation from and focus. Um, this is a does inner speech not always what is calm? Can you speak a bit louder? Does inner speech not voice in words calm as right and wrong speech? Sama or Mitya Pacha. How does one counter the disease of inner speech? Oh, through mindfulness and clear comprehension. Mental karma is still karma. So the inner speech, the conversations we have with ourselves, the thoughts and the moods we get into, the emotions, are still karma, good and bad. So we're training our mind in uh, wise reflection, what we call yoniso manasikara, and investigation the Dhamma. And so mindfulness and wisdom work together. So as you become more mindful, and that's why we, we use these different techniques to bring up mindfulness, then you're more aware of what you're thinking. And you can um, be more, uh, you understand yourself better. You know, what am I thinking? Is it wholesome, useful? Is it um, coming from the Dhamma, coming from an understanding of truth? Is it for my benefit, the benefit of others? Or is it not? Is it unwholesome? Is it leading to more confusion, more suffering, more stress? And as you practice more, you get better at looking at your mind, learning from your own inner speech hab habits, your thoughts. And Sometimes you have to be strong with yourself and teach yourself. Don't you? you have to tell yourself, stop thinking like this. This is foolish or unkind or unrealistic or frivolous or stupid. <laughs> you know, as you become more mindful, you see the way things are in your mind, the way you're thinking. So then you can assess it better with your your wisdom faculty, your intelligence. and keep or discard as is as is appropriate and that's one of the ways we define wisdom you know if you keep thinking thoughts that are making you feel miserable increasing your delusions increasing your suffering then as you become more mindful and aware of what you're doing you have to tell yourself stop doing this and then look for skillful ways to introduce introduce a better way of thinking so sometimes you introduce the opposite. So you're angry, so you bring up a thought of t tolerance, kindness, patience, and remind yourself that following those angry thoughts, you're suffering. If you're caught into thoughts of greed or selfishness, you have to, again, look at the danger in that and remind yourself this is not leading to peace of mind. This is stirring you up, making you discontent, or maybe... Um, unrealistic you know you want this and you want that forever wanting more things and you can't you know you can't have the, all those things you want so you teach yourself not to waste a lot of time thinking in that way you know these are just examples but you use mindfulness and wisdom reflecting on thought and sometimes you just use basic vipassana don't you just reflect oh, these thoughts are all impermanent they arise they pass away and you keep returning to that place of knowing, the mindfulness. And then the thinking and the conversations you're having in your mind don't take over the mind so easily and for so long. And you, you can keep the thoughts that are useful and wholesome because they're helping you to understand things better. They're bringing you to understand the Dhamma, the truth. They're helping your practice. They're helping you do the things you need to do in life. You can keep them because they don't disturb you too much and they're useful to you. But the thoughts that are harmful to you, you recognize so you start letting them go. You don't encourage them, you don't indulge them, you don't hold on to them because you see the danger in that, you see the harm in that. And this is one of the main skills of a meditator. You keep becoming, uh, 
turning attention back onto your mind and recognizing how you're thinking, what you're thinking, and letting go. And so seeing them as impermanent helps you do that. You know, oh, it's just a thought. It rises, passes away. It's not so important. You don't have to give them so much importance. You can let them go. Uh, we have another question, and this question goes like this. How can I get rid of lust? What are the practices that one can do to skillfully get rid of it? Um, well, contemplate the object of lust. So that's the human body, your own body and other people's bodies. You know, we get attracted to this body. It's the basis for our, most of our attachment in life is identification with this body as a self and the pleasure we can get from it. And lust in all its forms brings us pleasure. So that's why we lust after it. <laughs> so contemplating the unattractive side of the body, what we call the meditation on uh, a supa, the unattractive can help to balance up our view because when you're caught into lust you're obviously only seeing one side of things you see your body and the body of others as desirable attractive and human behavior you know, reflects that we're always trying to make ourselves look good through our clothing makeup styling hair physical fitness all kinds of things and then you know all the accoutrements, the accompaniments of life, you know, big house, wealthy, displays of wealth, power, also to impress others, to make ourselves more impressive and attracted to others, and then we're also attracted to these things in, in others. So contemplating the other side of it, seeing the impermanence, the unsatisfactory, the lack of self, and then the unattractiveness in all of these things. So like monks, we have all these different chants. You can see them in our chanting book every day. One of them is reflecting on the repulsiveness of the basic requisites of life, meaning anything that comes into contact with this body gradually becomes repulsive, doesn't it? You, know, you wear clothes and because your body uh, exudes grease, sweat, dirt, those clothes gradually become dirty, soiled, smelly, unpleasant because of the body. So you have to wash them or discard them eventually. If you wear the same clothes every day indefinitely, you never wash them, you, know, you become, well, other people would, be, would find it very difficult to live with you, be with you, and you yourself probably find it very difficult to be with yourself because you'd smell and be, just feel so unpleasant because that's the nature of a human body, isn't it? Same with food, you eat food. We only focus on the nice smell, the nice look, the nice taste, but food becomes unattractive very quickly, doesn't it? If you leave uh, a nice dish of food out for a while, it becomes inedible, goes moldy, becomes cold, unpleasant. You wouldn't want to eat it after a few days. Or even if it's pleasant food, fresh food, you put it in your mouth, mixes with saliva, goes into your stomach, it becomes unpleasant straight away and then you excrete it out at the end. Even accommodation, you know, your house, you have to keep cleaning, don't you? Because it gets dusty. Most of dust is coming from this human body, skin from the body. Um, so the human, the, the house, the furniture, the bedding, everything we use becomes soiled. That's the nature of the world we live in. This human body is constantly soiling it. Or another way of looking at it is, you know, you can do your a super meditation on yourself. Just observe your body for what it is. So you, you have all these different parts of the body. So like when a Buddhist monk ordains, say, the first meditation you're given is a contemplation of the body. You know, say, just hair of the head. If we don't wash our hair, it becomes greasy, smelly, unpleasant. 
Um, our skin becomes greasy, sweaty, unpleasant over time. If you to take the skin off a human body, they you ever see a surgery, and they you know, cut open the body, you know, inside looks doesn't look pleasant, does it? It's full of blood and gristle and bone and flesh and organs, and it's, none of it is attractive. The human body on the inside is unattractive. So these are all meditations and contemplations you can bring up to counter the very ingrained habit of lust. You know, what sells things in this world is, is lust, basically, because they make everything attractive to humans. You know, through advertising, movies, music, entertainment, selling things, selling each other, selling ourselves as people, and then selling products in the world. We're always trying to make things look attractive. Paint over the cracks, <laughs> cover over the unattractive side of things uh, by promoting the attractive. So we're in that habit of thinking, aren't we? We're always looking for the attractive because it stimulates us, brings us pleasure, uh, excitement, uh, stimulates our lust. So to counter that, you go to the opposite. You look at the unattractive and you, it balances your view up and the way you think about things. So every time you notice something that's attractive as an exercise, look at what's unattractive. So if you're looking at another person who attracts you, you know, their hair, their skin, the shape of their body, their lips, their this, their that, look at something else on that same person, that same body that's not attractive. Their you know, greasy hair, or their earwax, or their snot, or their phlegm, or their poo, or <laughs> their urine, all the bits that we don't like as human beings. Bring that, them up into your perception and it will counter the desire for lust, for, for a, the attractive side of somebody. You know, when you're ill, lust starts to fade out more because you know, your body becomes weak and often this, you know, when things go wrong with it, we, we don't look attractive, we don't feel so lustful when we're weak. So that's something to reflect on you know, when you're ill or when you sometimes monks will fast for a while when you fast you're not feeding your lust in the sense you don't have so much physical energy so often lust becomes weakened uh, so as many practices we can do bring, bring up the perceptions of the unattractive uh, sometimes you can also just contemplate the impermanence of the pleasure that comes with lustful thinking and lustful mental states it doesn't last. You know, the, the act of sexu sexual intercourse doesn't last very long, does it? It's a few minutes. <laughs> and yet it rules our heart, rules our life, rules the world. It, you know, <laughs> we're on Zoom tonight on the, on the internet, but the majority of internet traffic is pornography. So it really rules the world. But it doesn't last very long and it's not very satisfying. And it's, you know, people get enslaved to it, don't they? because it doesn't last very long and they're constantly seeking more um, so it's a kind of modern slavery we tend to think of slavery as you know, external slavery between people but we're also a slave to our desires and lust is one of them so if you want freedom from slavery well keep con bringing up mindfulness and contemplate the danger in lustful attachment and contemplate the unattractiveness of the body and this will help you. Is the order of noble with all art as a significance in the order they are mentioned? That is Samadhi to be immediate first before going to the following, etc. I have heard that pregnant uh, wisdom is more significant, and that is why the items related to that were mentioned first and not going to go up. Yeah, you're correct. I think that's why it is mentioned first. Right view that we gain from hearing the Dhamma. 
uh, reading and then contemplating the Dhamma for ourselves. It's, it's the beginning of the practice. You need some right view, you need some Dhamma teaching in order to know what to do, how to practice. So they compare it to a light, like the light of a lamp. Once this light of the lamp is lit, then the other factors of the path start to be illuminated. They start to come into, into action, into your, your mind. And really, they all arise in the one mind. They all arise supporting each other. But you need some wisdom and hearing the Dhamma first, just as that spark, the light. Or the Buddha compared it to right view is like the arising of the sun in the morning, dawn. Once the sun is up in the sky, then it can do many things. It lightens, brings light to the world and you know, it makes pl plants grow and helps human beings to be healthy and helps us to grow plants so that we can eat and do many things. And nowadays we have solar power as well. But before the sun is up in the sky giving us all this benefit, it has to arise first, you know, at dawn the sun arises and that's like right view it's the beginning of the practice is a little bit of right view hearing the dhamma reflecting on dhamma and then that leads on to the other factors i think most people will agree the hardest factor of all is the last one sama samati developing samati is not easy it takes time takes practice takes effort so all the other factors of the path are supporting Sama Samadhi, but it tends to be the last part of the practice that we fully perfect because it's hardest to calm the mind down and develop it. But all the other factors are supporting that. But in the end, say the noble ones, you know, they have all these eight factors arising in their mind together. Eight factors support each other, but it begins with right view. Well, probably what you're describing is what we call vibhaka karma, the result of past karma. So a lot of what we call random thoughts popping into the mind, they seem spontaneous, but really they're the, the final act, the final fruit of previously, um, previous acts of karma. So it could be based on memory, it could also be previous thoughts we've had popping up again. You know, the space in the mind and the conditioning of the mind is such that that thought pops up. Maybe it's something that's been important in the past, so it comes up again. So it's what we call resultant karma. What happens next is our fresh new karma. So how do you treat that thought? If you're mindful and you just know it as a thought arising, passing away, well, that's very good karma and you can develop insight and let go, free your mind from attachment. But if you take up that thought and develop it in an unskillful way without mindfulness, maybe it develops into greed, anger, delusion. Of course, that's now make, you're making unskillful karma, which will pre pre bring you more unskillful results, unpleasant results. Or you can turn it into something skillful, reflect on it as impermanent, not self, and maybe develop some kindness or compassion or investigate the Dharma in some aspect and it brings you wisdom, understanding, which is good karma that will bring its result. But just the random thought itself is not yet karma, is it? It's just the result of past karma popping up and then what happens next is your fresh new karma. Uh, 
All quiet tonight. That's so that's probably the end of the session tonight. Uh, I didn't see anybody on my screen here. I just heard, read your comments and heard your questions from the moderator, the Venerable Dhamma Whitako. So we'll end the session here um, and Venerable will lead you in paying homage to the Triple Gem. <laughs>